it's pretty fun for me to get to be with you all this morning on this side of the altar rail. As Jennifer mentioned at the beginning of the service, I have a couple of different hats I wear around here. I'm Sean's wife, your new senior pastor. I'm the mom to Sarah and James, who sometimes you see at children's time or in youth choir. This morning, I was the confirmation donut deliverer. But I'm also a United Methodist pastor. My current role is as a district superintendent, which in our world means that I oversee and encourage about 44 churches in the suburbs of Houston and their pastors. And I sit on Bishop Harvey's cabinet. I help her appoint and assign clergy to churches. Now let me be quick to add, because it's usually one of the first things that comes up, does that mean that you're Sean's boss? Well, not professionally, at least. <laughs> I knew that would get a laugh. I'm not the district superintendent for any of the pastors here at MDUMC. That would be complicated, wouldn't it? But my job means that some Sundays I'm here and other Sundays I'm out and about in one of my district churches. It does mean that Memorial Drive is a part of the district I superintend, and I want to take just a moment of professional privilege to introduce a guest here today. Just as you all here at Memorial Drive have a lay leader, Greg Nelson, who sits on committees to represent the laity, at the district level, we also have a lay leader. His name is Kevin Larson. Kevin, would you stand just so that people can see you back there? Kevin is our district lay leader, and he's a member at Strawbridge in Kingwood, and he makes an effort to connect with lay leaders in local churches, and I'm really grateful for his presence here this morning. So, oh yeah, great. I hope you'll introduce yourself to Kevin. So Sean has really teed me up for success today, hasn't he? It's my first time preaching since he became senior pastor, and here I am talking about stewardship, about financial generosity. And it's not necessarily a softball topic, is it? And mostly that's because we get a little squirrely talking about money, don't we? It feels private, but what I want to suggest to you today is that money, how we spend it, how we talk about it, how we think about it is personal, yes, but it's not private. It shouldn't be a secret that we feel embarrassed to talk about. As I've been thinking about it, I can't help but think about money and God's desire for how we think about it, how we spend it, how we give it in the context of Thanksgiving happening later this month. We're all starting to think about where we're traveling or who's coming into town, where, what, who's gonna be responsible for bringing or cooking or baking what, and we'll sit around tables. We'll be grateful for all of the things that we have and then boom, the next day, Black Friday, we'll be told to think about all of the things we don't have, won't we? And then after that, it's Small Business Saturday, and Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday. And of course, we don't have to go that far in the future. Already, stores are having pre-Christmas sales, running Black Friday specials, and the Amazon Kids catalog was delivered to our house with a place for the kids to write everything that they needed this year for Christmas, which I took as a personal assault. The next few weeks will be full, full of opportunities for us to think about what we have and what we don't have. So with all of that in mind, with all of that in the background, I guess the best first place to start is, why do we give to the church? Why does it matter that we give? And I wanna be really clear about this. We are talking about the generosity of giving money, yes, because the church depends on your generosity for its operations for the light bill and the insurance premium and the staff salaries and choir music and VBS, all of it, all of it depends on your generosity. But that's not the most important reason why we talk about giving. The most important reason why we talk about giving money is because we believe, I believe that there is something important, something fundamental to my discipleship, to becoming more like Jesus, that happens when I give. It's why we give. It would make our lives a lot easier if we didn't give. 
There would be more money in the checking account, more money for vacation and kids' college fund. And after a visit with the dentist this week, we learned more money for the future braces fund. There would be more money for all of that if we didn't give. But I believe that giving has something to do with discipleship has something to do, my generosity is tied up with becoming more like Jesus. And so I give. And next Sunday, Sean and I will join all of you in making a pledge to give to the church in 2025. So today I want to encourage you in that. Let's turn to our scripture and see what it has to say about this. Here's the backdrop. Paul has a long history with the church in Corinth. While we have two letters, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, in our New Testament, there are other letters referenced within those, and it details their relationship. Multiple visits back and forth are cited. This is a church that he knows well and loves. But it's a church with complications. Does that sound familiar? The church, any church, is full of fragile and fallible humans. And that means that the church, any church, is fragile and fallible. During his previous visit, it seems that Paul got sideways with a member. So now he's writing asking for reconciliation and support. Paul is expressly asking the Corinthian church for money. But interestingly, he's not asking for money for himself, which he does in other letters. Rather, he's asking for support for the Hebrew Christians in Jerusalem. The Christian community in Jerusalem had faced persecution almost from the very beginning. Paul was worried about these Hebrew Christians, and he was asking the Corinthians, a group of Gentile converts, to help them. Jewish Christians, Gentile converts, Not necessarily the most likely of folks to be generous toward one another, but Paul laid out as an ideal for the church not exclusion or difference, but rather deeply felt mutual concern and burden sharing. And the people were responding. And here in this part we'll read together, Paul is encouraging them to finish in the same spirit of generosity that Jesus has had toward them. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Hear now the word of the Lord. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. Here's how it goes in our house. For the three months before Christmas, I fret and cogitate about what to give the kids for Christmas. I keep a note on my phone with a list of ideas. I'm gonna have to change that tactic now, now that there's a child in the crowd today. But I keep a list of who's giving what, what ideas we have, what the grandparents are giving, what aunts and uncles are giving, what we're giving cousins. Sean and I will text ideas back and forth, all to make sure that everyone's treated fairly, that there's no overlap. It takes a lot to make it happen. And I know that many of you do that same work. And then on Christmas morning, the kids tear through the gifts that we have so carefully and meticulously planned out over the previous months, and then they start playing. 
Maybe it's putting together a Lego set or riding a new bike or cozying up in a new sleeping bag. But then, inevitably, Christmas break wears on and they lose interest or something breaks or just the novelty wears off. And it won't be long till we're out at Target picking up batteries or paper towels and they'll ask if they can walk down the toy, uh, toy aisle or check out the dollar section just to, ha just to get something, just anything, because our desire to get as humans knows no limits. It's insatiable. It happens the same way without fail. And I know that it happens to my parents before me and their parents before them. It is a cycle. Yes, there is something wonderful about getting we love opening presents, and we love new things, and we love the surprise of something we never would have bought for ourselves. But I wonder if you experience it the way I do, that the best part of gift giving is actually being the one who gives. Because when we get something, the new wears off, the luster fades, but giving, giving something truly meaningful that stays with us. Just think, if you were the one to get down on one knee and propose to your beloved, you remember that moment forever. Or giving a bicycle to one of your kids, they take off down the street, eventually the bike will break or they'll, they'll outgrow it, but you will remember that moment always. I remember the feeling I used to have of making mixtapes for friends in high school. I would carefully think about how long I had on each side and how many songs would fit and the flow of the music. I spent a lot of time putting that together. And I suspect that my friends appreciated that for a while, but not near as much as I had enjoyed putting it together. And that's because there is a joy in giving, in generosity. There is something particular, something special that happens to us, in us, when we give. When we give, we become more like God, who himself is a giver. And here in this letter to the church at Corinth, Paul is encouraging the people not just to give because there's a need, but to give not just because there's people in Jerusalem who need the support, but to give because God himself has given generously. There's one translation of the text that says it like this. Can you, who have been so generously treated by God, be anything else but generous to one another? And here's the thing. Paul didn't ask for the people to give a certain amount. He wasn't all that concerned with how much they gave. You'll notice he doesn't say, okay, we have 400 Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and they need about 10 drachma a day and there's 90 days, so four, da, 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 da. we need X amount of dollars. No, and he doesn't say, okay, there's 229 of you in Corinth and we need this much, so X divided by Y equals, no, this isn't a tax. He's not asking them to give under compulsion. He knows that that's not joyful giving. Rather, real generosity comes if people are reminded that God has first given to them. It would not have been as compelling or effective to send out some amount that was due to the Jewish Christians. Instead, Paul reminds these Gentile converts of God's generosity in and of itself, and that that is what calls us to be generous. Paul is interested that they gave not how much they do. And this is because giving is personal. It's not private. Paul is clear to talk about giving, but it is personal. Paul makes it clear that neither he nor God are all that interested in comparing the amounts that different people are giving, but Paul is convinced that believers are givers. I wanna suggest the same is true for us, God is not nearly so interested in how much you give, though I'll say something about that in a minute. God is not nearly so interested in how much you give, but that you give. But then there's this little line that Paul puts in the letter. He says, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful, 
is the Greek word hilarios, which it won't surprise you is the root for our word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. What does it mean to be a hilarious giver? Sometimes our giving is hilarious, as in laughably small compared to all that God has done for us and given us. We look at the abundance in our lives, the families we have, the number of choices for cereal in the grocery store, the ability to come and go as we please. There is so much abundance in our lives, and yet in return, we parcel out some morsel for God. I'm not sure that's the kind of hilarious giving that God loves. But then there's another kind. Our giving can become hilarious as in being caught off guard by the delight, the sheer joy, even the hilarity the gift brings to others, to ourselves, to our beloved church. God loves a cheerful giver a hilarious giver. It doesn't say that God loves a rich giver or a wealthy giver, though I'm sure that God does indeed find that lovely. No, God loves a cheerful giver, someone who gives generously because giving brings joy. In church history, there was no one who illustrated hilarious giving more than Brother Juniper. Brother Juniper was a contemporary of St. Francis of Assisi. His joyful generosity, his hilarious giving, bordered on lunacy. He would give the poor the very clothes off his back. After several embarrassing episodes, Juniper's superiors ordered him not to give his tunic or any part of it to someone who begged. But soon after, Juniper was approached by a poor man asking for alms. He replied, I have nothing to give except this tunic, and I cannot give it to you due to my vow of obedience. However, if you steal it from me, I will not stop you. (laughs) Juniper was left naked, returned to the other friars, and told them he had been robbed. (laughs) His compassion became so great that he gave away not only his own things, but the books, the altar linens, the capes belonging to the other friars. When the poor came to Brother Juniper, the other friars would hide their belongings so that he could not find them. Now, I don't want to encourage you when the offering plate is passed down the pews to take your neighbor's wallet and to give hilariously on their behalf. But there is something about giving that brings us joy. We know this. But that only happens if we let God have God's way with us. Martin Luther, the reformer, was right when he said that in order to be a Christian, three conversions are required of the heart, the mind, and the checkbook. I heard a colleague who talked about growing up with a single mom. They didn't have a lot. But they went to church every Sunday, they sat on the back pew, and every Sunday she watched as her mom made a check out to the church and put it in the offering plate. It wasn't, didn't matter how much she gave, it was the very fact that she did so. She had been fully converted, heart, mind, checkbook. In some ways, Paul's writing here echoes the writer of Proverbs, who said, some give freely, yet grow all the richer, Others withhold what is due and only suffer want. A generous person will be enriched. The invitation for us is to put this into practice, to practice being generous because we believe that God delights in that and that when we are generous, we more closely follow Jesus. Next week will be Commitment Sunday. Yes, it matters to the church so that they can budget and plan for the coming year. But more importantly than that, committing through pledging is an opportunity for us to be the people we always said we would be, the people who made a commitment to serve God through the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Pledging is a chance for us to say how we'll do that in the year ahead. You all are talking about going all in, being people who are all in as a way to become more like Jesus, holding nothing back. 
I said earlier that God is not nearly so interested in how much you give, but that you give. And I believe that's true. I believe that the first and most important step in hilarious giving is giving itself. But I also believe that hilarious giving can be understood in two ways. Giving hilariously little compared to all that God has given us, and giving hilariously, as in giving with abandon and with love. There are a couple of ways to think about that. The first is to give intentionally. To say, I'm going to give something every month or every week. I'm going to be intentional about it. It means that you pledge a certain amount, not based on your income, just because you want to start the practice of giving. So you might say, I've never really given before. I mean, sometimes I put a few dollars in the offering plate when it comes by, but I've never been intentional about it. I'm going to start now. I'm going to decide now to give intentionally in 2025. Then there's proportional giving. Proportional giving looks at whatever it is you make, whatever comes in as income into your house and says, I'm going to set aside a portion of that, 3% or 5%, to give to the work that God does through the church. It takes a portion. And then there's tithing. Tithing was how God talked to the Israelites about giving. It's understood to be the biblical standard that we look at what we make and we set aside 10%. Now, that may not be hilarious giving in your household. Based in your circumstances, that may not be the kind of giving God's inviting you into. I once heard a story of a son talking to his father, and he said, Dad, you'd be so proud of me. I know that it's always been really important to you that we support the church financially. And I want you to know I've been a tither my whole life. And his dad said, wow, I, I am glad to hear that but I'm a little disappointed that you haven't grown. The tithe is not the pinnacle of giving. It might just be your starting point or your plateau. God longs for us to be hilarious givers, cheerful givers, not giving begrudgingly or woefully, but giving from our heart because God has first given to us from his heart. I mean, just think about God as a giver. Has God ever given you anything? Is there anything in your life that you look at and you think, I can't believe the goodness of God to have given me this family to love, to have given me meaningful work to do, to have given me friends who love and support me in times of need, to have given me a church where I come in and people know my name and care about me? Do you think that God gives us those things begrudgingly or guardedly or reservedly? I don't. I think God gives us those things cheerfully. And we, made in the image of God, we who long to be more like Jesus, we are invited to model God and his generosity toward us and to give cheerfully, hilariously. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.